TC Alberta. We're going to try to round up some of the uh, build blitz and maybe take a few more steps in this design process. You've obviously gone out and you've read the game manual, which is the first thing you always do when the season starts. And maybe some ideas are starting to bounce around your head and, uh, you know, maybe some strategies of how we can play this game and how you can launch some things. So I hope that we can go through the next step of this, looking at this on a very accelerated pace to actually build some of these things in CAD, test them out, see if everything fits, and then maybe start prototyping some of them in, uh, in proper form so we can see if they actually function the way we think that they do. That being said, uh, I've got my model here. I may end up using this. We may end up using the Studica one. Who knows which one or which drive base we're going to be using. But uh, first we have to do something very specific. We actually have to go in and we have to do a quick CAD on the game elements themselves to make sure that everything fits. This is one of those important pieces whenever you go through a game. And I couldn't find the actual game elements online. I may just not have been looking hard enough. But I'm going to go through quickly how to actually, um, actually CAD them so we can test the sizes. So I'm going to put them on my second screen. I'm going to go back to my... Uh, main folder here in uh, Fusion 360 and right now I've got build blitz I'm gonna create a new folder call out game elements fantastic let's do this game elements um, double click awesome start a new design and let's call this design what are we calling these these are the rings And the ring is actually a really simple thing. We're going to create a sketch. We're going to pick a plane. We are going to draw ourselves a, an axis of rotation here. And we're going to make it a construction line. And then we're going to simply draw a cross section of the ring itself. And what I know about the rings is that they are five inches in diameter. I'm actually going to turn around and change my document settings to inches because all the game manuals are in inches. We will uh, go ahead and draw this. We know that they are five inches, uh, plus or minus a quarter of an inch, probably to accommodate for the squish factor since they are foam. So we're gonna make these 2.5 inches in radius for that line. And then we are gonna draw one side of this ring. Now we know that the ring itself has a, I'm looking at the diagram right now, it is a one inch, it is one inch deep, okay? Simple math there, we've got five inch diameter ring with a three inch diameter center. That should theoretically give us a two inch diameter uh, outside and the ring itself is 0 0.75 inches tall. So that gives us the rough cross section of this particular object. I can actually go ahead and construction line this bottom line. It did its job. Now, just looking at this, and I'm gonna do this right now. There's two different ways I can do this, but uh, I'm actually gonna round off the edges of this because I can clearly see that there is a fillet on the top of this. And once I go find my modify, there's my fillet command. I'm gonna fill it off a little bit of this. It doesn't look like it's a very deep fillet and it doesn't specify what the actual fillet is, oddly, but we do know there is one. So I'm gonna just put a 10th of an inch fillet onto the outside of these. And it also looks like there's going to be a chamfer on the inside of the ring as well. Um, and we are going to go ahead and do a very, very slight chamfer on that. Actually, should we represent it as a fillet? Now nah, we'll chamfer it once it's 3D. We're going to finish our sketch. Now you notice that I've got a shape and I've got an axis. And that's exactly what I need to do what's called a rotate command. I click on the shape, I click on the axis, and I'm going to get a ring that looks like what I want it to look like. Uh, I'm going to put a quick chamfer on this using my modify command. The chamfer is simply a flat edge cut off of this. So I can see that I've got a chamfer like so, and in the drawings it looks like it's uh, it's a fairly flat chamfer. So I'm going to go for a um, uh, let's go for a 0.2 and a 0.4 on this one. I'm looking at my drawing here, that looks like it's about right. I'm probably going to do the exact same thing on the other side just to make sure it's nice and even. That was a 0.2 and a 0.4 and a 0.4, and there we go. Now, they are clearly are orange, so let's make sure this thing gets the right, to be the right color. We click on it, we right click, and we then go to our appearance, and we, wherever my appearance tab has decided to go to, there it is, fantastic. Currently we have this random gray color here. I'm just gonna grab an ABS plastic for the sake of argument, and I'm gonna edit it to be the correct color. It's around orange-ish, I'm gonna grab something around here, done, and there's our ring, not bad. From here, we're going to go ahead and we can save this file as our ring. And uh, now we have something that we can base some of our measurements on because it's going to be a pretty close approximation to what we have. Now we make the next piece, which is the wobble goal. And let's go ahead and actually put that together very quickly here in CAD. 
Same thing, new design, file save, wobble goal. And this is gonna help us design something that can potentially move this wobble goal around. And that's gonna be a really, really a piece of the challenge here this time around. Move sketch here, and we look at our wobble goal. And our wobble goal has a few dimensions on it, as you can see here. And we'll just follow them as is using that same kind of rotate command that we did before. Draw a nice solid axis of rotation all the way up. Construction line that, and it looks like I'm in metric again, good. Metric is the superior format, but Again, all of my drawings are actually in uh, all of my drawings are actually in Imperial right now. So let's draw a line out here. This is gonna be four inches because it is an eight inch wide goal. Four inches across, and we are gonna draw a line 2.5 inches up. And the wobble goal itself is kind of weird. It's given me a, it's given me an arc, but it doesn't tell me exactly what the arc is here. So I am gonna have to guess to a degree it to what the uh, arc is gonna be on this one. And we are probably that didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. Here we go. Let's just do a nice three-point arc here. Try that again. Three-point arc. Again, loading. Good. So center here, start here. Let's give it a nice arc based on kind of what we see in the drawings. Okay. Now, you'll notice I've highlighted the wrong thing here. This is one of the advantages of using construction lines when you're working, because when I construction line these things, they don't form a shape, because I don't really need a shape here. I'm gonna go up, it is a 0.5 inch jump, according to the drawing here. And then we are gonna cut this uh, back across, and it doesn't explicitly say how thick this next part is, the little rim edge piece um, for the, the wobble goal itself, so I'm gonna assume it's gonna be uh, 0.1, just for the sake of argument. Okay, I'm gonna back down 0.5, just like we do in the drawing, and then I'm gonna cut this all the way over to here. Awesome. Now, I see that I've got a pipe that sticks out of the middle of this thing that is one inch in diameter, so I'm gonna draw a line back 0.5 inches from center to give me something to work with. I'm gonna drag this back up, and I know that the difference on this it is three inches to the top of the wall, uh, base of the wobble goal, and then we've got an additional 12.5 on top of that. So that means that this, all told from where I'm drawing it, should be 10 inches tall. So let's do that. Oh. It is ten, yeah, it's 10 inches tall, let's go there. Okay, once I've done that, I can go ahead and trim some stuff that I don't need anymore, like those two lines, and uh, life will be pretty good. Now, the wobble goal itself, this goes right to the top, and I drew a 0 0.5 inch radius across there to make a one inch diameter, and I know that at the very top of this, there's actually a section here that's a little bit wider. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm actually going to draw uh, an additional 0 0.3 inches in diameter, which means 0 0.15 inches in radius to actually do another piece here. Now, it doesn't exactly say how high the top is. I'm gonna make an assumption here it's about two inches high. Um, it's, it's not defined on the diagram, and that does sometimes happen. I'm gonna go ahead and trim off this extra piece here. I'm gonna zoom out so I can see my base. And I'm gonna finish my shape off by drawing a line to back to the center point of this drawing, and then back all the way down to the bottom. And what you'll see is that highlighted, so that's now an actual shape. And this is where this gets really fun, because when I finish my sketch, that's a perfect cross section of the wobble goal, which means that when we revolve it, we can actually click it in the radius, and we're gonna get that wobble goal in its entirety completely done right now. And that's kind of cool unto itself. I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. I'm gonna to go to appearance. Uh, and I'm actually, once it loads, going to go ahead and uh, add a couple new things to this drawing. I'm going to add two different colors because we clearly have uh, white and black, or black and red going on here. I'm just going to pick a number, uh, I'm going to change black here. I'm just going to rename that so I know what it is. Black. There's never an excuse for not naming your files properly when working with CAD. Please do so. It makes life better for everyone involved. Let's hop over to a red here. Let's give this a solid red, a 25500. Done. Again, forget that I go back and name this thing appropriately ABS red. Now, it may not be ABS. We're not really doing any testing of the specific piece of uh, specific materials here, so that's okay. I'm going to go to faces, and I'm going to make the bottom face of this and the outside rings black, just like they are in the drawings. Then, we're going to go with red, and we're going to red the rest of it. There we go. And I feel like I missed a face here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can actually get the edge there. There we go. There's a wobble goal. And that is going to have all of the actual um, all of the actual dimensions that it's going to have from there. I'm just noticing that my uh, top piece of this is actually 
it looks like it's a little bit a little bit off I'm gonna go try to fix that right now very quickly I'm just gonna close my appearances tab I'm gonna go into my sketch I just decided that this two inch marker up here at the top that seems like it's a little big based on the drawing edit it to one and you'll see that when you edit the sketch you actually edit the whole drawing so now I've got a wobble goal now I can do some testing I can actually see if stuff fits the way it's supposed to and I, I kind of have an idea that it will um, but now I can actually confirm that so let's go back and let's go into the uh, basic bot I've got studic and Tetrix I'm gonna create a new folder here and I'm just gonna call it shooter photo types because this may work for either of those particular uh, robots who knows yet Okay, shooter prototypes, I'm going to create a new design again, and I'm just going to call this um, prototyping. Shooter prototype one, save. Because right now we're just playing with CAD. We're experimenting. If this is you and your team, everyone can make their own file. You can share files. You can look at what each other have done. Every time you hit save, the rest of your team can see what has gone in here. So you can actually lay out an entire prototype, sometimes really quickly, to find out if all of the geometry is going to work. Because nothing sucks more than building the whole robot, putting four or five hours into actually assembling something, and realize that you missed something that didn't quite fit. Now, the very first thing that I'm thinking of strategically is that I need to go do a little bit of research into how some teams have, have handled this challenge before. Very rarely do you find a robotics competition challenge that is completely unique. And this case is exactly the same way. In 2013, FRC had a competition, I believe it was Ultimate Ascent, that actually looked a lot like this. It involved shooting frisbees. And a frisbee and a wobble or and a, um, and a ring, like we're talking about here, actually are very, very much the same kind of thing. They're a very similar object when it comes to actually throwing them. So let's go back and let's actually do some review. Because when you want to do this, you want to learn from the best. And uh, as you can see, I'm actively looking at some flywheels here from Andy Mark. And that's something that we often do is look at parts when we're here. But I want to flip to the Einstein finals for 2013. And I want to just clip into the first game of Einstein finals. Here. finals and um, I'm not sure there's any sound here, but they're about to go. And this is actually where I'm going to focus on a few teams here. Specifically, though, Team 33. Team 33 is on the right hand side there, taking shots from underneath the pyramid. And everyone can see that they have a cassette that is articulated. The set goes up, the cassette goes down, and it actually allows them to take pretty efficient shots. Now, I want to take a look at this match and watch how they've done this. I like the Hoover mechanism where they can actually pull vacuum their, uh, vacuum their objects in. Again, this is a very similar game in terms of what they could do to this year's game. Also, as you can see, it seems to be shooting with some horizontal rollers, which aren't that hard to make, aren't that hard to make work. You might have to pick up some PVC or something from the hardware store to test those out. That's not something that's exceptionally hard to do. Um, you can actually see that this game in 2013 was um, not necessarily the most entertaining game to watch, as you're seeing 16-19 back here, 15-19, apologies, who are back in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, Scoring a lot of goals from 54 feet out. That absolutely was a piece of this year's set of 2013. Now, I want to point out, this is something that might happen this year, but the ultimate goal. When you're talking about how to shoot, uh, in this case, a ring, you've actually got the ability to use flywheels on top and under the bottom push the ring out. You can also push the ring from each side. It does switch, so there's some compression that you can use to actually make that happen. The compression is quite powerful. And um, we can explore those. The other one that some teams did this year, if you look at 50 and 19, their actual shooting mechanism right here is actually using a single flywheel that started the frisbee spinning. And that might be something that might work out to as well. Because a disc that spins inside of the chute will whip itself around in the exit gate of the chute, up to the quick considerable speed. It's not where we're going to start, but it may be something that's rather good in this year's game. I'm going to stop the, uh, to stop the broadcast here on this one with the Einstein, because the next part doesn't really affect us the climbing. We just had multiple years of climbing games, and uh, I guess in FRC, the priest line on the T6. But uh, let's take a look at what we could do with this with CAD. Let's go back to Fusion 360. Now, one of the cool pieces here, and I do have a shooter prototype, that's good. I'm gonna go back to my part files. And one of the cool things I had here, actually, first I'm gonna to go to my game elements, and I'm just gonna drag a ring in. I'm not gonna worry about the wobble goal right now. 
the uh, the shooting the ring seems like a fun challenge to look at for right now. And that cassette idea, the idea that you could suck the rings into a single cassette, move it up, and then shoot them back out, seems like a really efficient way of doing this, really efficient way of doing this particular challenge. So let's go back and let's actually look at some of our part files. And I'm going to grab Tetrix here because I was looking at something on my desk here. And uh, 288 millimeter channel, and again, I'm going to do some conversion here. Five inches is about 127 millimeters. So to fit three rings in there, I'm going to need a really, really long channel. I'm going to design this for two for right now, and we'll see where this goes, because you never know. It might, might go somewhere, it might not. I'm going to grab a 288 millimeter channel, and I'm just going to spin it around here to see how it fits. That's 90 degrees there, and I just want to make sure that this ring would fit. So I'm going to spin to the right side. I'm going to see that yes, this ring actually fits really effectively in this channel. This could be a really, really good fit. Now, the weird thing is, if you look at some of the videos that are going around about this game so far, you're actually seeing that this um, this ring is actually spongy. It actually has a lot of a lot of elasticity, and that actually could cause problems for us because if we put a flywheel in the middle of this, the middle of it's going to bend and put pressure on the outside. So we may need to have the flywheel on the top and the bottom, or we may need to find some other way to support the bottom. Let's grab this and let's actually copy it over and see what we can do for a design here. Let's grab this guy and get a little move on with this pencil. There we go. Get a little move. So 180 degrees. Let's go to the top. Let's line this up. I want to see if there's an easy or easy-ish at least way to make these uh, make these rings line up, and there might be. I'm just going to grab this channel and ground it, and I'm going to attach a plate to the bottom here, just a flat building plate to make this uh, to see if there's a good way which we could, we could actually connect this at the front and back for right now, just to give it some structural stability, and uh, go from there. Just going to see how this lines up. Yeah, looks like it might line up all right if we're careful about it. Perhaps not. Perhaps we'll have to get a little bit creative with this. So what we'll do is we will line our build plate up. And of course, with the Tetrix kit, uh, the Tetrix are nice because everything is at eight millimeter centers. And I think this is about where I want to be. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be using these, uh, I'm not gonna be using these holes quite as they were intended, in the sense that I am gonna grab one of our smaller holes here. These guys right here. These little, uh, these ones here will get me an actual connection point that will actually work fairly effectively for what I think I want to do. And let's try it out. Okay, we'll fuse that on there. I don't think I grabbed the right one. Let's try it again. Joy of CAD. If things don't quite work out, you've maybe only wasted yourself a couple of button clicks to try it out. There we go. Press OK. Now let's zoom back out. Let's see if we can get something that's going to hold this ring relatively in place while we uh, while we play with it. Sure to have the wrong piece here, and that's okay. Zoom out. That's about my width, and I'm just gonna see if I attach that there. That's not quite gonna work. So we're gonna slide out and disconnect it using one of the uh, kind of secondary holes here. I plan on supporting this at the top. So really, um, not being able to attach all of the holes. That won't be the end of it. Okay. So now I've got something that looks kind of like a carriage, and I can actually see that I can load one. And how many rings do you think we could load in? Do you think we could get uh, get a couple in here? Possibly. Oh, looks like it. And this might be a really good setup right here for us to actually try to load a couple of these. And I know the uh, the game manual says you can load three. You might have to get a little more cr creative with a cassette that holds three, but I think we can get two pretty well and actually get started with this as an idea at least. So. We've got this bottom plate. I'm just going to copy that bottom plate and put another one near the front. And I'm going to see what a single flywheel would look like for this particular uh, this particular design. And I'm going to try to do this one completely with a Tetrix kit. It may not be the most elegant thing we've ever done in our lives, but um, I think it actually will work fairly effectively for this one. So let's try this again. I'm just going to grab the smaller hole here, and I'm going to see what uh, my matching one on the bottom is. It's going to be this guy right here. And there we go. Okay. That guy's mounted on. I'm not going to worry about mounting the other side together, but I can see that I actually could have a pretty effective cassette here without trying too hard at all to actually bring these in. Now, there's two questions we need to answer. The first is, how do we get a wheel spinning fast enough to actually push one of these rings out? 
likewise, we also need to know how we're going to have a wheel to bring these in, or whether we're going to use arms to bring them in potentially. But let's let's figure out the flywheel piece right now. So typically with a flywheel, we're going to use the most powerful motor we can. And since I'm going to try to keep myself to the Tetrix kit here, that is our Torquenado. Now there's a slight problem with the Torquenado. And that is that in order to get any speed on a Torquenado, if we're indeed committed to shooting this, uh, shooting this ball in some way, shape or form, uh, Torquenados are not the, uh, not the fastest motor out there. And in fact, we can check their technical specifications, go actually into uh, the Tetrix website here, and let's check what the actual specs are on these things. Tetrix Torquenado. Okay, let's go to the Torquenado and let's see what happens. Torquenado, I believe, has 100 revolutions per minute, I believe is the uh, correct. Here we go. We are going to be working at a huge stall torque, but our no load speed in revolutions per minute is about 100, and that's not actually that fast. Um, I might actually have some options here. I'm just going to take a look. I do have different gearboxes available, including a 40 and a 20 to 1. I just have to go see what the default is here. The default comes with a 60 to 1 gearbox. Now, that means that we're getting a lot of torque out of this, but if we switch to a 20 to 1 gearbox, if we specify that, we actually could find ourselves happen, or working at three times the speed, and that might actually work for us right now. If we cut this down to a 20 to 1 gearbox, uh, we lose a lot of the torque, but we don't really need it to shoot a foam disc or a foam uh, ring in this case. So a 20 to 1 would be really, really effective here. That's going to give us 300 revolutions per minute. That's not super fast. We might even have to make that a little bit faster with some uh, sprockets. I'll show you how to do that here, though. Let's go back to our CAD and just uh, mount this thing down and see what happens. Okay, so that's the motor that's going to drive this. We probably need a flywheel to actually touch the uh, touch these uh, rings and actually get them moving. So let's grab a wheel and again, committing myself to trying to use just the Tetrix piece. I would much prefer, uh, for example, an Andy Mark uh, an Andy Mark compliant wheel. That would be my preference for a flywheel. But given this is what we have, let's actually turn this around and see what we can do. Okay. What we have is we've got this wheel, and we know that if we just touch the top of the ring, we should be okay. But we want to make sure that we're not clear of the ring. We want to make sure we get a little bit of compression. This wheel is going to be spinning pretty fast once it actually gets going, and you know, realistically, it's probably going to make contact and move these uh, move these uh, rings pretty quickly. So let's take a look and see if I actually can space this out properly using the uh, bars that I have. I will note that the rev, rev kits for spacing out flywheels like this are really good. So if you actually want to use the uh, those kits to actually line those up, this uh, wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. So let's see what we're going to do. How do we want to attach this here? I think I'm going to be really relatively simple here and just grab some 96 millimeter channel. And I'd probably turn around and bolt this onto the side. But let's see if this is actually what will work for this particular model here. All right. Now, what we've got is uh, we've got something here that may or may not work. So let's take a look. Let's line this up. Let's line this up. And let's take a look from the front and see what we get. Uh, it might work. I'm just thinking if we're going to line this up a little better, I probably want it to have a little bit of contact with the spongy uh, spongy ring that is here. There, 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 there. I actually think I could probably find myself making this uh, flywheel. Oh, I just realized I put the ring in the wrong spot. Let's put it right at the bottom of the channel. Now let's try the flywheel. If I put my flywheel down here, I'm going to end up with something that doesn't line up particularly well with anything. That's okay. I think this is a point I might actually try to do a custom part because I'm going to re realize that the spacing just doesn't quite line up here, and that's okay. And by custom part, I mean I'm going to grab a flat bracket. If that decides to load, I'm going to replace it. Uh, replace this piece with it. So let's give it a little spin. 90 degrees, right there, right there, right there. That's okay. I'm going to make this guy go away because I don't really need it anymore. Um, now, this flat bracket, we can take a look here and see that when I line it up on the bottom here, it is going to not line up with where we want. But what will line up is the wheel itself. And this is where this gets interesting. I probably want this wheel to just touch and maybe compress the, the ring a little bit. 
not too much. So we're gonna line it up right there. I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna center this hole on the uh, lower hole here on this bracket, um, and I'm gonna use it to actually connect my flywheel. Now I'll probably have to reinforce this a little bit. I'm probably gonna have to add some pieces to this just to uh, make it a little more structurally sound. Uh, but for right now, this will this will do what we need it to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece out. I'm going to join it into place just so that I know my spacing is all correct. And we're going to line it up with the flywheel where I think the flywheel needs to go, right here. And we're going to take and we can actually go up here and we can use a snap tool. Figure out where the snap tool is. It's been a while since I used this one. Hello, Emma. Well, instead of that, I think we're just going to manually align this so that we know where it goes because we're really just going to open up this hole. And if we click on our flat bracket, we actually want to unlink this break link. It's going to allow us to actually change this part if we wanted to because in this case, we kind of have to. So we're going to go in. We're just going to give this an edit. Uh, where's our edit? My edit in place is a double click if I remember correctly. No, perhaps not. Anyways, I'm going to drop a sketch on the side of it and I'm just going to open up this bottom hole, bottom hole here. Because right now I know that I've got a four millimeter, eight millimeter diameter hole right there. And I'm just going to turn the second hole here into the same. Uh, that's our diameter, so I'm going to go eight. And we're just going to do a quick, uh, quick drill. I'm just going to extrude this out by two millimeters is how far this bracket goes. Yes, it does. Press OK. Cut it open. Now, all that's going to do is put another hole in here. And structurally, this isn't ideal. I mean, we could definitely do better with this. Um, actually, I'm wondering with this whether we maybe want to use one of these uh, flat plates. No, we've actually used all four of these that come in the kit. So we'll stick with this for right now. Now this probably isn't strong enough to handle what we need it to, what we really need it to handle right now. Um, but what we could do is we could add another bracket to make a triangle here and actually strengthen this out. But for right now, this will prove our concept and we can see if it would actually work. Now, that being said, we've got this piece. We actually want another one of these. So we're just gonna copy and paste. We're gonna paste a new version of it. Now when we do our actual design, plans that we're going to send to a build team here, we are actually going to take this piece and we have to note that this piece has been modified so that the build team knows, hey, I have to drill a new hole in that one. And that's going to allow us a place to actually have our flywheel. Now, the flywheel in this case is really simple. We've talked about the idea that if you put a 20 to 1 gearbox on this, you get about 300 RPM. Um, we probably want to go a little faster than that if we want to get a decent shot with these these rings. And this is where the testing is going to come in. Because we might have to design something like this. We might have to have the build team assemble it and test it and see if it works. This is what we call the design thinking process. And the idea that we can actually do iterative design. We can keep trying different things to see where it goes without really trying too much. And I think I, I, I'm actually tonight going to probably try to finish this up, going to try to hook it up, and I'm going to see if I can actually get the thing to run uh, and prototype it here just in the uh, in my uh, my basement at this point. So let's finish this off. We are going to go grab a TMX flat bar. Oh, no, flat bar. I want a round bar. I want an axle. Let's finish this thing with an axle. Now you notice that I'm not finishing the rest of this stuff, uh, things like the uh, the back of the bracket or exa exactly thinking about how exactly we're going to pull these things in at this point. We'll deal with that as we uh, go along once we know we have something that works. All right, let's see if we've got an axle that's uh, big enough to actually hold this here. It doesn't appear that we do, so we're going to have to go find one that's a little longer. That's 100 millimeters. We might find one longer or... We might have to extend something out. We can do that. Um, let's do this. We know we need an axle that goes all the way across. We know that we have a piece here that works. Let's let's modify this slightly. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back. I'm going to keep this steel axle because I just realized in looking at this that this steel axle is not quite wide enough. And if it's all I have in my kit, uh, I'm going to run into a problem here because I'm going to run into uh, having... Uh, basically having an axle that won't quite work for what I need it to do right now uh, and that's no fun so let's not do that let's uh, let's make this thing work properly the way it's supposed to um, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go to those two flat brackets I created I'm gonna delete them and I'm gonna replace them with um, a kind of a matching piece something that we can something we can still make work here in this case I think an L bracket is probably in order for this one 
and the L bracket that I want is going to be is there the square one. I don't really have a square one. I guess I'm going to use a 32 millimeter channel. Uh, Fusion right now is telling me that the sketch I did down here. Uh, uh, because I deleted those parts, it actually doesn't do what it was supposed to do, which was modify that part, because that part no longer exists. In that case, I can go back down and actually delete this sketch, and it'll make all of the things that don't quite work on my sketch go away for now. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're just going to we're just going to nicely join this uh, piece into the main bar here. Copy a little copy of it, put it on the other side. This is going to give us something to actually mount the brackets to, and we're. Uh, and I actually solved one of our two problems from the stability issue before, in that the new bracket isn't going to have a hole in the exact same spot. So let's use the exact same kind of bracket. I'm going to go and get the flat brackets, because I kind of like these because they have that flat piece right in the middle, and we can actually do some stuff with on these. So let's spin this around 90 degrees. Let's spin it back up 90 degrees. I just realized it spun it the wrong direction 90 degrees. Oh uh, well, that happens to you sometimes bracket go for a spin my friend selecting the face instead of the whole object which is not something I want to do today 90 degrees that is good now I'm just gonna look at the front of this I want to see yeah I probably want to put the flat bracket on the inside of this one so we'll just go to our joint command and we'll join this side to the wrong side and we'll join this side to this side and that will be nice and well secured and as you can see now, this actually makes things even better uh, in the sense that I'm actually going to be drilling a hole through kind of the more stable part of this particular bracket. It's going to be bolted down a little bit better and not have as long of a lever arm to actually kind of affect it. And that's a good thing in almost every sense of the word. So what we're going to do is we're going to drill that hole. I'm just going to check where my, uh, where my wheel is. Good, good. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece here, start a new sketch on the edge of it. And I'm actually going to use a button called project. I love my project command. Project is going to allow me to actually go in and project this circle directly onto this piece, into this sketch. And we can see that right here. Okay. Once I've done with the project, that means that I can now actually use that circle that I've put on the sketch. And when I finish my sketch, I can actually use it to extrude out the two millimeters I need to. And again, we're going to put a note on the production, um, the production of this that says, um, we're going to cut. No, it's not going to let me do that. Why is it not going to let me do that? Let's try this again. Don't create a new sketch. Use the sketch you had before. And let's just redraw this circle. I'm just going to draw one over top of it and use the, the lines that we created as a, uh, as a guide for your sketch. And let's see if we can do this now. We're going to cut here, and we're going to cut out. I'm suspicious that if somehow put this part on the wrong... Oh, I know what I've done. I forgot to unlink the flat bracket. It's still linked back to the original part in the parts file. And it won't actually let me modify it because if it modify, I modify it here, I would actually be trying to modify the part file. And who knows what else is referenced by that part file. Well, I know in this case, nothing's referenced by this part file. But, you know, regardless. Now I've got the flat bracket with the hole in it. I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste and send a new one all the way over to the other side. And constrain it into place. In this case, I'm going to constrain this side onto this side, and press OK. And we're going to end up with something that now can actually hold our flywheel in place. So very quickly, we're going to take this, uh, take this axle here and build a flywheel axle. And we're going to use a part that may not be in the Tetrix kit. Because right now, the best chance we have of actually making this thing spin is to use a gear train. And we're going to talk about how to make that work in just a second here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to grab the axle uh, plate or the motor plate. There we go, axle hub. I'm going to put it uh, one, maybe two of them even on the uh, on the actual flywheel itself. So let's do that. 90 degrees. All right. Let's take and connect uh, this guy right here. This guy right here. Let's finish that up. And let's then take a copy of this piece and just spike another one onto the other side of this wheel. Now 
Now, when all is said and done, this should create a fly flywheel that's relatively stable, that spins fairly fast, and should be able to, ooh, see I moved my flywheel. I'm just gonna check this out from the front just to make sure that I've got everything aligned. It looks like I do. That wheel, or that axle is gonna be long enough to actually make this work. And so I'm gonna actually throw the stuff on I need for it. Uh, so I've already got my motor, uh, my flywheel um, wheel hubs on there. That's easy. And then I can turn around and add on a couple of set uh, axle collars because those are going to be important. I actually may I may only actually need one of these at the rate I'm going because the part that I'm going to put on the end is actually going to be a sprocket. And I'll explain sprockets versus gears in a moment. All right. Actually, you know what? Since we're doing this out of the whole basic kit, I think we should probably do this with gears instead of sprockets. It's going to add a fair bit of weight and uh, weight distribution specifically, but let's try it out. I'm going to grab a couple of these bronze bushings here, and I'm going to throw them into my actual, oop, there we go, I'm going to throw them into what I'm actually working on here. And let's actually attach this up to the... Uh, the flywheel bracket here. And let's grab another one on the other side. Now, as soon as this flywheel's up, I think we're going to go and try to do a prototype of this and actually try to put this together. There we go. Now, that should, theoretically at least, give us something that we can work with here. Now, those bronze bushings are gonna be, it looks like a little bit too long for me to attach anything to. So I think I might turn around and I might just, uh, I might just turn around and unlink those and just do the same thing I did before and actually modify those ones just a little bit so that they fit nicely. I've got a sketch on the end and I'm going to simply throw a circle to the outside of them. And I'm gonna actually just extrude them down and again, in my production notes, I'm going to make sure that my build team or my fabrication team, depending on how your team is built, knows that those just don't have to be, they can be cut down by about seven millimeters. Oop, that obviously didn't work. Let's go back to our sketch and modify that out a little bit. Uh, oh, that sketch is good enough. So let's go back and modify my extrusion, which is down here in my timeline in the feature. And clearly, when I click on my profile, I missed clicking on something I needed to click on. Let's click on the middle. There we go. Now that's nice and cut down. And we'll put that in our production notes that we're going to actually modify that bronze bushing and just cut it down, perhaps with a saw of some sort. Or if you're uh, lucky enough to have a lathe, uh, you can use the lathe to do that really, really effectively and really smoothly. Let's click here. Let's click here. Uh, uh, right there. And let's mount that on there. Okay, now we're good to go from here. Now the last thing we're going to need here is we are going to need to attach this axle onto the uh, actual flywheel setup here. So let's do that. Again, we use a joint constraint. This is gonna spin. So we're actually gonna use a revolve constraint. And I think I'll do it from the other side because I have the shaft collar that's gonna help me line it up right there and right there. All right, that shaft collar should be in a good spot so that we can put our flywheel axle down. And then we can simply turn around and we can actually put on a the flywheel here. And I just realized that I used the wrong kind of axis on that last one. I'm gonna go back and fix that in just a moment. But for right now, we'll put our flywheel roughly centered. As a team, you're gonna have the ability on that one to actually move that around once you uh, once you get there for testing. And uh, depending on how you want your uh, want everything to move. I'm just gonna move this back to about five millimeters because that seems good. And then I'm gonna go back to my joint here I'm just gonna edit the joint. I know I gave the wrong kind, but I'm gonna go revolute. And you notice when I do that, you can see it starts to spin. And that's awesome. Because that should allow my flywheel to spin. And at least it will at least show what we're doing here. Now, what I just realized in doing all this is that I actually attached that to the wrong spot. And again, this is where your whole browser is really, really important. I realized that this joint right here actually attached to the wrong thing. So I'm actually going to change it. I'm actually going to go back and deselect my second selection. I might deselect my first selection too, uh, and see that right now my first selection was the wrong hole up here. Second selection was to put this guy into it. Now, since I attached everything to my bronze bushings, I'm just going to go change this down to there, 
and I should be able to put that bronze bushing in the bottom. Now, that bronze bushing goes there, and I might need to move this one as well. So I'm gonna go back through my constraints and see which one actually did the job there. I think it might have been this one. Let's see. And this one is what put that bronze bushing in there. It is. So let's click the first thing, and then let's see if I can put it in the correct spot in the hole we custom drilled in this plate. And let's go out right there, and let's see. Did that work? I believe it did, but it kind of flipped everything around. So let's take another look at this. Let's go back to that rigid 12, and I'm just gonna delete that joint, and that should let me get everything out of here. That's still attached. There, 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 there. Let's delete that, and let's pull this whole thing out. Now let's try moving this around. Sometimes in CAD, this is what you have to do. You do have to go back and forth a little bit, knowing that you won't get everything right necessarily the first time. Oh, I've managed to link this together. That's fantastic. So I'm just gonna go back a couple steps here. I'll go back. To this control Z until I get back to right here. Now, at this point, let's go back and see what I can do about this joint again. Because I believe it was this rigid 13 that actually caused the problem for me. That's the one that actually put that into the space there. Now, this was a, a correct kind of joint, and I'm going to actually deselect the first part of this joint, and I'm going to reselect the bottom part. And that seems to have flipped, that, uh, flipped things on me. And I'm not sure why it flipped it. It must have changed the joint angle, perhaps. Let's just change this to zero degrees and see what happens. No, that did not do what I thought it would do. Mm. In this case, I'm going to go back to joint 13. It's messing with me right now. I'm going to cheat a little bit on it. And I'm just going to realign the, uh, align the joint into the right spot. Uh, is that the correct number of millimeters? It may be. I'm just going to spin my screen around to the very back to make sure that I got the correct alignment here. No, it would be 40 millimeters. There we go. Um, no, and that that hole clearly is not in the right spot. All right, we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go nuclear option here, and we're going to take and delete rigid 13 again, and just go back and reattach everything. At this point, I should have everything still. Uh, I should st have still everything still constrained. So I'm just going to capture my position and just do that piece one more time. Spin it around, spin it around, and reattach. Let's see what we do. That is in the correct spot. Put it in place. That spins. Life is good. All right. Now, the last piece, before I go out and walk this uh, away so I can go test it and see if it actually functions, because I do need to do something with this uh, with this motor here. And I'm, I'm just going to I'm gonna go ahead and actually connect this with a couple of sprockets right now. And to do that, I'm, uh, oh, I do not need another folder, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to go ahead and upload some a couple of Tetrix sprockets. Even with the core bit kit of parts, you are going to need to order some things in a given season. Uh, we could do this with gears, but they do tend to slip unless you build them properly. And so I'm going to go back, and I just have to go find the correct. Um, I have to go find the correct file for my sprockets. Now, the key thing that we're doing here with a sprocket is we're actually looking to try to increase the speed here. If I have a small sprocket and I have it acting upon a large sprocket, so the small sprocket is driven, for every one turn of the small sprocket, I'm going to actually get less of a turn of the large sprocket. And that's kind of where um, that's kind of where we're going with this. We want to make sure that we use that idea. Uh, gears, I may not have it in this folder necessarily. Let's see what we can find here. Channel, channel, change. There we go. There's my sprockets. They are just in the wrong folder. File management matters, boys and girls. So if I have a small sprocket turning, its circumference is going to be smaller than the large sprocket. So for every one turn I get from one sprocket, I'm going to get less than one turn on the big sprocket. That's going to give me a power advantage. That's actually going to increase the torque on my uh, on my motor or on my uh, whatever is driven. If I do it in the other direction, though, if I use a large sprocket on my motor and a small sprocket on whatever I'm driving, I get the opposite effect. I actually get something where the thing will go faster. It won't be as strong, but it will go faster. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to turn around, and we are going to attach a... We can take a look here. We're going to grab an axle with a set screw. And there are two, two sizes of axle hub in the, uh, in the Tetrix kit, so don't get those mixed up. Not sure if I have here. I hope I haven't. Uh, but I'm just simply going to attach this hub onto this gear for right now, and just kind of slide it up the uh, up the motor a little bit. And I know that that's a joint I'm probably going to need to edit. So I'm going to say motor to gear enter. 
interface. Oh, sprocket interface. There we go. And then I'm going to do one more. I'm just going to grab one more of that same part because I really do want to use this thing with the sprockets. And I'm actually going to attach this right onto the end of here. And likewise, this is one that I'm thinking I'm probably going to have to use again. So I'm going to make a point once I put that on there of uh, naming that one as well. I'm going to say flywheel to sprocket. That's sprocker. Spell your names properly. And from there, I think I've probably got enough time, saved enough time now. But my sprockets have uploaded. Yes, they have. Here we go. Let's grab a. Uh, I think this is, I believe this is a 40 tooth sprocket. It might be 35. Well, let's take a look. What does it get named when it comes in here? It is a. I uh, have to go look that one up. Anyways, we're going to spin this guy around. And part of what we're doing here is finding a way to attach this sprocket, which is going to go on the motor, to the smaller sprocket, which is going to go here. I'm going to just grab the smallest sprocket I have. And I'll have to go check the part numbers here, but I do believe. Uh, well, I do believe I'm going to get a 3 to 1 gear ratio out of this. 90 degrees. And I'm just going to spin myself around, and I'm going to join these sprockets onto these plates that we just created. So now at this point, all we have to do is we have to find a way to attach this sprocket motor combination and have it actually drive this sprocket. And I'm going to warn you, depending on how this is built, you want to get this motor as close to the base of your robot as possible, especially if this whole thing has to articulate. If it's going to move up and down, I want this motor to be as far away as possible. Um, and uh, in doing so, I'm probably just going to take a look at where my everything lines up. I probably want, ideally, something that looks sort of like this, which means I'm probably going to need to put a um, couple of bars across this. And that's okay. There ain't nothing wrong with that. One, two, three. That's going to be an interesting challenge, though. So let's do this. Let's grab some 160 millimeter channel. Good. And let's uh, spin it around uh, once or twice in a couple different directions. Bolt this side down as uh, as heartily as I can right here, and I'm going to realize when I look at this that uh, as per my beginning piece, it doesn't quite line up exactly where it's supposed to. I'm just going to make our rings invisible for a second. You can see that uh, it, it does line up well enough that I'm going to be I am going to be able to bolt this together, though it isn't going to be exactly pretty, and that's okay. We're not going for pretty at this point. We can go pr pretty with our final uh, final design. I do get two holes that are going to mount really nicely to that one, though. So at that point, I should be able to throw another one of those channels in and just spin it around 180 degrees. There we go. Let's slide it back. Make it so it doesn't interfere with things. And we're just going to use that one as support at this point. All right. And same thing. I'm just going to bolt it down onto something solid. there and that's going to give me a really solid fit right there. Now the only reason we were doing any of that was so that we could actually go ahead and mount down um, one more piece of this which is the motor bracket and then we can go prototype this. We go test it out at this point and see if we have something that works because I suspect we do but you never know until you try. Spin that around 90 degrees, pop it up here slide it out that way just a little bit. Now one thing that I'm realizing when looking at this is that once I do bolt this down I'm going to run into a bit of an issue which is that my gear is not going to have anywhere to hang off of here and uh, that's something I'm probably going to have to address at some point during my build season uh, probably by uh, cutting off a piece of this and modifying one of my parts but now uh, I've got something that doesn't quite line up here that's okay might have to modify that a little bit further yet, but for right now it will work for a prototype. This is why we CAD things. And I'm going to line these guys up, and we're going to see what, what, what we've got. 
So right now I've got a gear that just doesn't quite line up. I'm going to go to that last rigid joint there, and I'm going to try to rotate it a little bit just so that we try to get things that actually work here. Um, where's my rotation tab? There it is. Let's rotate this so that the gear is as high in the air as possible. There we go. Now we do have a little bit of interference. That's okay. Nothing we couldn't fix by cutting down a couple of these bars. They will still function. Now, at this point, this here, the, the one sprocket and the second sprocket, should actually move this flywheel. We should be able to actually test if this whole cassette would function to actually fire something. That's where I'm going to go next. We'll try to prototype this and we'll see how it goes. Cheers. See you next time.